Unlock the full potential with your business with Leadershipity. Our proven strategies have fueled growth for countless organizations. Ready to elevate your leadership and scale your success? Book your free 15-minute consultation now. Click the link in the show notes below and let's make your business soar. Hello and welcome to the Winners Find Away Show. I am your host, Trent Clark, serial entrepreneur, international speaker, new author of Leading with Winning Teams, and longtime coach in professional baseball coaching in three world series. So I am thrilled to have you join us on the Winners Find Away Show and with my special guest, Luke Hessler. What's up, Luke? What's up? Thanks for having me. Man, I'm pumped up to have you here, man. Like, this is a topic that is on point right now because, man, you run a digital PR and marketing agency for entrepreneurs. So all my folks out there learning how to build teams, everybody else, you're running an organization. Man, this marketing thing, the landscape is just feels like a constant change. So tell me a little bit about man, Ace Branding, and tell me a little bit about how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you the 30,000 uh, foot view of it all. So I um, I got into the marketing space originally when I was marketing for my own company back, well, my own brand really back in 2012. I joined a network marketing, affiliate marketing company, and I was looking to sell products online. And basically I couldn't do it at all. I could not figure out how to make it happen. No one would take me seriously. You know, just, I was, I was just failing for six months. I fell flat on my face until I started to learn how to build my personal brand on social media. I didn't know it was called that at the time, but what I observed was the fact that when people, when I messaged somebody on Facebook at the time, they would not know who I was. And then they would click on my profile and then they would judge me in a matter of seconds based on what they saw. And so I was like, okay, if I can not post about me being a college kid and partying with my friends and doing things like this, maybe <laughs> some people would take me a little bit more seriously. And so I started Fair. making it a little Fair. bit more intentional. And so I started posting things about business and advice and documenting what I was doing and like motivational things and all this kind of stuff. And to my surprise, people started to answer me my messages. And I started to realize, oh, wow, the more likes I get on my post, the more people think I'm legit, things like this. And I started to realize that if I can build my perceived credibility online, so that when people look me up, they perceive me as someone who is credible and legitimate, then they would give me the time of day to actually have a real conversation with me. And then that was kind of like the catalyst for me getting into this space. And so I started doing it myself at first for you know the first five years of my entrepreneurial career. Then for the next five years, I've been helping other people go and do the exact same. Yeah, it's incredible, man. I mean, I mean, it has been a journey of tackling this thing at a very young age and learning on the job. I mean, literally, you're learning on the job. You're pivoting based on what you're learning. So what I love about your journey here, Luke, is that, man, as, as a young guy, you're just sponging information. And, and you also come from this era of familiarity with the digital world. You know, you've always had a phone in your hand as a kid. Like that's not uncommon. You know, it's very different for guys like me in our fifties. You know, we, you know, we got phones about 25, you know, where it really became like really influential where you're like, Whoa, man, I, I, I can remember I owned 1-800-GOT-JUNK in Phoenix. And I remember when we started like getting direct orders, text to our trucks. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. <laughs> it, was like, it was the thing, man, was like 2001, you know? And I was like, man, this is huge for our logistics and managing things. And so you could see how technology serves us well, but we can also see how it jacks us up, right? So a little bit of background on you. Uh, you're now in Traverse City, Michigan. Did you grow up in Traverse City? I did. Yep. I grew up, I graduated here. Then I went to Michigan State, lived in West Bloomfield for a year, then in Scottsdale for five years and circled back here about two years ago. What are you, what are you Traverse City West guy? What are you? I was, I was. Traverse City, Traverse City West. West. What's up, man? <laughs> Traverse City West. Hi. All right. So um, yeah, not going to run with the rich kids over at St. Francis. So I love, love Traverse City area. One of the best places in the world. And everybody who actually visits knows this secret. We're in Michigan. It's no secret. The secret is well out in Michigan. The people who come and visit come up for a summertime visit in Traverse City and literally fall in love, Luke. It's absolutely crazy. People, I have I have vacation rentals up that way and people come and just go, holy cow, Northern Michigan, who knew, right? And right. Uh, my house is up by Torch Lake, of course, which is yeah. an incredible area. And man, it is something special. And as a kid, you know, we started going up there early because my sister, who was Miss Michigan teen, 
mm. put her name in the hat to do this little cherry festival thing <laughs> and, and one miss cherry festival queen and i was like oh that's kind of like you know man i'm having we got all sorts of fodder jokes for this like she's got three brothers right, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. then her reign as the queen was probably 10x in value and commitment to the state versus her state of michigan title yeah. and she met some of the most incredible people grew her network 10x and the responsibilities and the the value of equitable value for scholarship and money for college was incredible. So for anybody who will listen, I just tell them, hey man, Traverse City is the place. It's a spot and it's up and coming. I'll tell you, I um I never wanted to like stay here. Frankly, I always wanted to leave. Cause I'm like a small town. Everyone always grew up, you know, they never leave. And then I traveled the world. I went to, now I've gone to like 45 or 46 different countries now. And I saw everywhere and I was like, Traverse City is actually awesome. And so now I chose to live there rather than just living there. Cause I was born there. And yeah, I, I tell everyone, I'm like, you got to come and see, but you got to come and see in the summertime because if you come in December, it's a little bit of a different story. <laughs> well, if you're coming in winter, and this is what I discovered about coming back to Michigan. Michigan. You know, I'm a Michigan kid. Yeah. And so I came back to Michigan to live here about maybe five years ago. And I've had a house in Northern Michigan, but it's always been like a second home for me. And so we've always had rental properties up in that area too. I've had that for probably almost 15 years, but man, coming back, you do realize after traveling the world, like it's a really good place to raise your family. It's a really good place for values and you right. appreciate it. And I, and I can remember like saying as a kid, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm never coming back. <laughs> I like, got like, oh, man. Like I don't like I don't love the winners, but when you do come back, I really had to accept like, man, get out and snowmobile, get out and ski, snowboard, play hockey, like yep. get, do do the winter things that are absolutely fun and a blast, and you know get involved because it's such an active state. But you do have to go out and do it. If you're sitting at home in the gray, man, it can get a little, it'll it'll get long. That's right. Yeah, I tell people there have to be like activities that get unlocked by the winter where it's like, because if you like to snow, if you like to ski or snowmobile or any of that stuff, you can't do it without the snow. So it gives you something to look forward to. But if you don't have any activities that you enjoy, then it's just, it's just frustrating and annoying. <laughs> all right. Our Trevor City Tourism can send us a check for this. All right. So yeah, please, uh, pretty absolutely. good. Like, we, we can hit them up. But uh, so now you start these, you run three different companies now. You're, mm -hmm. you're just over 30 years old. You, you know, of course, like you said, you look, that's a hard thing. You even mentioned it in your marketing. Hey man, I don't look like a seasoned veteran. I, I got the grays, man. It, it, it works <laughs> now for me because, you know, everyone thinks I'm, I'm seasoned, right? So, but yeah, you're a young dude and you're creating a lot of value for a lot of partners and brands and uh, man, everyone's like, man, I, I thought you'd be older. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm all worried, right? So you deal with that, but walk me through the challenges of building a network in multi-level marketing and that high value and then doing again, transitioning that to your first agency. What were some of the challenges out there for a, for a young guy or a, a, long, a young looking guy for like yourself? Yeah, well, there was, I mean, so many challenges. Where do you even start with it? I mean, number one is the biggest challenge is you have to believe in yourself, you know, and that in itself is a difficult thing to be able to go and do because my parents are traditional in the sense that they're doctors and they thought that education is the key to success and everything. And so here's me wanting to go build this online business and start this thing. And they're thinking I'm wasting my time or throwing my money away. I mean, I even got started in the business. I went to my parents, I gave them a proposal because I didn't have 600 bucks to get started with it. And they gave me a loan to teach me a lesson that these quote unquote things don't work. And so it's, it's overcoming that doubt and realizing that it's possible. And, um, and that was something that I had to fight with. And so that's one of the hardest things. And the second thing is like, once you believe it, now you got to get other people to believe it. And then that's even more difficult because it's like, okay, now you, I, and when I started, I really was this college kid on the ramen noodle diet. Like I was an idiot my first year of college. So I had three minor in possessions of alcohol, meaning I got caught for drinking <laughs> underage three times, you know? So I'm like, my parents thought I was a black sheep at this point. They're like, what did we do wrong? You know, all these things. Yeah. And so like I hit the rock bottom at this point and I tried to, to make it happen, but I felt like I had this opportunity that could really change people's lives financially if they just plugged into it. But I just couldn't get people to go and listen. And so that's when, after I believed in myself, then that's when I really set out to go and figure out how to get other people to go and believe in me. And, um, and just give me the time of day. Cause I knew if they would sit across the table from me and hear this out, then they would understand what I'm saying. Cause if they saw what I saw, they would understand why I do what I do and we could move forward. And so it was figuring out how to transfer the vision that was in my mind into other people's brains. And, and that's a difficult thing, especially when you don't have the proof 
to prove it at first, right? Because when you first start, I'm broke. I have no experience, no success stories. So why should anyone listen to me? You know, a couple of years later, when you have 40 kids on your team that are all driving BMWs and Mercedes from the company, now you're like, yeah, it works, you know? And that's a different game because now you have to build leadership. You have to duplicate things, you know? It's like, and so every level, there's a different devil, I would say. But um, the two hardest ones for me to go and tackle were me believing in myself and then being able to then get other people to believe in me and transfer that belief. I mean, I got to tell you, Luke, you know, I'm 54 years old, right? Yeah, I coach in three World Series. I've created like three companies over a million dollars in revenue in the first eight months, three different times, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I've also failed on a bunch of companies, man. And I meet people all the time and I go, man, I suck, dude. Like, I I, I mean, like, I, I'm like, I, everyone's got a little bit of imposter, man. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about this the other day. I was out speaking in Coronado Island and they were taking good care of me. I'm their speaker and I'm excited about, you know, joining them for this conference. And so I've got this beautiful room with my patio right on the beach on Coronado Island. And I'm like, thinking, man, this is great. And, you know, I'm about to order some room service. And then one of the Navy SEALs runs by, like in full gear, running like a four and a half minute mile pace. And he runs up north of the beach till I can't even see the guy anymore. And I'm like, I don't know how many miles that was, but it only took him like about 15 minutes to get out of sight. <laughs> like, And I'm like, holy crap, man. And you know, meanwhile, my food comes and doing my nice breakfast. And, and then here he comes on the way back. And I'm like going, now I gotta go to the gym. Bro. <laughs> what, what am I doing, man? Like, I am just like out of shape. You know, like it was so quick to be just self-degrading and like imposter, man. Like, holy cow. So yeah. I, I don't know, you know, I, I'd love to say, hey, man, I'm a secure guy and I know who I am. But man, I think there's always challenges in that as you meet successful people. I want to hear going on your parents, man. I want to hear your parents loan you a thousand dollars or whatever, right? To start your mm -hmm. business with the intent that you're going to fail pretty quickly. And maybe this is a, Hey, I'll get my head on. You'll get back to school. But meanwhile, how long from that loan until you and your friends are all driving Mercedes from the multi-level marketing business of you creating a network of tens or hundreds of people that are creating value for this product. Yeah, so it was um, the first six months I fell flat on my face, you know, like didn't find any success really at all. I'd get like, you know, five, 10 people to join them, they'd quit, five more, 10, didn't quit. Yeah. Da, 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 da. But in about month seven, eight, nine, things really started to, to pick up for me. And it was by my first year, I was pulling in about $50,000 a year, which like at the time was about what the average college graduate made, you know? And so that sure. was when I went to my parents and I was like, hey, look, you know, I got this car, I'm making this money, you know, like give me six months to go all in on this. And I was basically told them, I'm like, let me treat this like an internship where, you know, six months and no classes, full focus. And if it, if it fails, fine, you know, I learn and come back. And if it goes well, then we'll reevaluate. And then at that point, that's when I went all in on it. And um, I basically lived out of a plane for, you know, a year of my life, traveling to just different college campuses, being able to duplicate what we did at State at those campuses. And um, I mean, the business multiplied by 5X and it was, you know, pretty insane. So it's party yeah. on right there. Michigan, yeah. State, <laughs> Michigan right. State dropout, Luke Hessler here, you know, talking <laughs> about like literally Sparty on right there. Well, I still love the team. I just had to leave the campus. So you leave. And the multi-level marketing is cooking. Like you said, five acts in six months. I mean, now you're putting in the work, but you're yeah. having a ball. Like life's looking pretty good. Your parents are going, dang, this backfired. He's not going back to school, man. The kid's driving a Mercedes. He's 20 years old, you know? Like, so now... Tell me how long does this last and how's it end? Yeah, good question. So yeah, I mean, from the time I was like 19 to 23, I was doing this and it was, yeah, it was amazing. You know, we made a ton of money. We were traveling all over the world. I had such a great sense of purpose, met incredible people. And like, frankly, I thought it was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. You know, I just had visions of being able to take that industry and that company to just the highest level. And, and so that's what I thought I was going to do. And then, you know, one day we wake up and get a phone call and the company shut its doors. And so, you know, every, all the, the bank accounts were frozen, you know, no, nothing came in just like overnight, everything just stops. And that was a scary moment because I remember it. I'm 23 years old. You know, I have over 10,000 people on my team, like around 50 of these average age. And this is, by the way, 22, 23 years old. You know, we have about 50 people that are driving these company cars, but it's not like the company doesn't give you the car. They cover the car payment, right? So now that the company isn't there, all these kids still have the loan out for the car and still have payments that they have to go and make on this stuff. And now they're not making any money. And so there's still a lot of, a lot of very heavy, heavy burden. And so at that point, I was just like, how can we transition? How can we get people to a spot where they can breathe again? And I had some mentors at the time that thankfully I made some phone calls and they guided me to a certain place. And we made a transition to another company and 
negotiated some deals that were performance based that if we would have you know hit these certain metrics we'd get these bonuses to help these you know people transition and thankfully we were able to smash those bonuses and like that was you know and, and our business actually grew from there but and no one's car got repoed anything like that which was like an amazing thing for me personally because that's I mean at this point I had some good I had money I wasn't necessarily worried about myself but I was really worried about our team and things like this and so thankfully they were good to go but what happened with that transition was that we it was a it was a transition out of fear and so it wasn't like i took time to really evaluate who's the best company what's the best thing for us to go and do it was like hey was my mentor he said here's the company can they pay us out to get these people paid yes all right what bonuses do we have to hit let's work and then we went and i when i look back in my entrepreneurial career and just in my life in general any decisions i make out of fear usually are not the correct decisions and that's that's what that was and so it was even though it's short term made it work made it work it um long term did not work for us you know so within like 6 to 12 months of that we're like all right this this isn't the thing and at that point i was ready to just do my own thing because you know the company Frankly, I don't want to get details of it, but the company, they made some promises. They didn't deliver on those promises. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like building other people's brands and other people's things. And like, it's annoying. So let me now do my own thing. So that's when I started my agency. I was like, all right, I taught people how to grow and monetize their brands, their personal brands. I've done it. I've taught all these people. Now let me actually take on clients and help them go do it. And so that's when I kind of transitioned into the next phase of my entrepreneur. Yeah, incredible. I mean, and, and one, one thing that most people don't know about you, Luke, is that, I mean, as you take this thing all over the world, you're a young 20s. You know, meeting with the president of an African nation, the first democratic leader in Johnson Surley, who went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, hey, man, I'm like this 20 something kid from like Traverse City, man. Like, what? Like, how did I get here? Right? Like, so when you do these things that kind of open up the world and you realize, hey, people are people. Right. Like we're yeah. all just out here trying to do our best. And man, I mean, obviously President Surly just creating real value for, for her nation and amazing kind of shift of your mindset from 20 to 25. And also you and I both know, hey, the tough things are kind of really where the growth happens. Right. That's where you really get the hit. Yeah. I agree with that 100. percent I mean, actually, when I actually met um, President Jonathan Surleaf, it was it was actually before I started all my businesses. So I ended up actually meeting her because of my aunt. So my aunt was the director of the Peace Corps um, under the Obama administration, and so I was able to go to Africa for a month with her and spent two weeks with President Jonathan Surleaf. And the other two weeks, I met I spent in um, Nimba, which is like third world Africa, where they don't have running water, no electricity, nothing like that. And um, and so it gave me a completely different paradigm of of life in general because the people that I met who had nothing were actually the happiest people I had ever met in my entire life, which was so crazy to me because I'm like, wait, these people are suffering. But emotionally, we in the West were suffering a lot more than these people were. And it gave me a new perspective on on what happiness was, you know, and what life was about. And it really just carried me into what I did. And it was the, actually the reason I got so all into the business was because I fell in love with the concept that if you help enough other people get what they want, you can get everything that you wanted more. And I always had this like distinction. I'm like, do you just want to help people or do you want to make a, a bunch of money? And I thought I always had to choose between the two things, you know, but when I found a philosophy and a model that allowed me to like, help other people. And then that helps me. Like I, I could really get so passionate behind that. And it allowed me to like have my full desire behind it. But then going into what you're talking about when it comes to kind of adversity is I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, the reason I found success at a young age period was because I had very strict parents, you know, like if I didn't have an A at something, you know, I, I was in trouble, you know, like I was not expected to just play the sport. I was expected to excel and do my best in these things. And while I was a child, I often resented them for that. Looking back on it as an adult, it is the very reason that I had such a high standard, you know, for myself. And then when I look back on my various businesses, I mean, I always tell people you can learn a lot more from my scars than you can my accolades. And I think that's really the secret, you know, is being able to embrace the pain and the challenges, realizing that like it's it's a part of the game and you've got to be able to go and learn those lessons. You know, I always tell people it's like the secret to success. Yeah, the people say it's like getting up or falling down seven times, getting uh, back up eight. But I'm like, the real secret is not tripping on the same branch twice, right? Because you can't keep making the same mistake. And sometimes that's what people do. They're like, oh, I'm persistent. You know, I'm never going to quit, but they keep making the same mistake. And then the other people who just quit when the pain gets tough and neither of them are going to end up winning. So you have to commit and persist, but then also learn and grow throughout the process as well. I love it, man. I really resonate with that trip. I mean, I, I've taken my kids on mission trips and, and, you know, and I often remind my kids like, hey, when you were in Ecuador in the jungles in these villages and these kids have basically one change of clothes and a sand bottom hut, that's it. Like, I don't, 
know if I recall any kids that were more grateful and more happy and more balanced. Like, Crazy. like, hey man, like they're running around. They love it. They're doing their food. They make themselves like they can make their own clothes if they need to. And like, they are absolutely some of the most joyous people. And it's absolutely authentic, man. And it's not like, oh, you know what? My life stinks because I don't have a TV to watch the soccer game. Like, you know, no one's saying that, right? Like, it's just, uh, that's not their position. So it, it's funny how maybe imbalanced we are in the West sometimes. And it's a challenge because we do have so much. But love that. I love the take on you know the scars and the falling down especially over the same branch i mean i think that's a that's a challenge for anything and any time that i've uh you know we, we talk about athletics and one of the one of the superpowers of athletes is hyper learning right like you have to learn process and you have to learn it very quickly and you have to learn that that process may change and and, and adapt to it quickly mm. which is very similar in business right like you're gonna have to adapt to something quickly but you got to have the skills actually to adapt to it you know, and so athletes go into strict training and they're, and they're coached, which it sounds like that's what your parents were doing for you. They were putting you in strict training and this is the standard we're setting it. And you're going to go into training to learn. And it's not always going to be like pleasurable, man. Like strict training is just that it, it's challenging and it's adjustments. And, you know, so I love that you're so grateful for your parents on that. Tell me how that strict training has served you through some of the challenges because I want to talk about your next agency, mm -hmm. which is based on the show, you know, winners find a way. You know, winners when shown data that they are losing, find a way to win. You've already had one multi-level marketing group that's booming and then doors close like abruptly and you're like, holy cow, make an adjustment, do the best you can to unwind it. And then you start your own agency. This will never happen to me again because now I'm in control, right? Yeah. How many years until you're not in control again? Two years. Um, so we, we found success pretty quickly in that agency. You know, it jumped over that, had a good reputation and a brand. That's another reason I tell people build your personal brand because companies come and go. Like corporate brands, they come and go. But guess what the common denominator is in every business or every anything you do for the rest of your life? It's you. Okay. So it's like if you build your brand and you build a brand that people respect, they know you're honest, you operate out of integrity, you're intelligent you with your decisions and things like that, then whatever business you do or whatever industry, you're in, people are going to be like, oh yeah, Trent's in that, then yeah, that's legit, you know? And then it, it helps go with everything. And so huge reason we are able to find success quickly within the agency from is from that standpoint. But anyway, okay, I'm going to pause you there for a second. Okay. <laughs> so, but Luke said it's very important right there. Like your, your brand, it, you know, as, as I came through athletics, everyone was always talking about Luke. Oh man, it's all who you know. Well, yeah, I knew Nick Saban. I knew a bunch of people. Yeah, great. But you know, here's what Luke just said. He said, what's going to be really important is how people know Luke Hessler. Do they know him to be reputable? Do they know him to be a hard worker? Do they know him to be able to accomplish things? All these things that he's done in his life to say, hey, I'll take a bet on that guy. And so, you know, Nick Saban and Ken Manny from Michigan State fame, and those guys were willing to put their name on the line for me, which really helped me get my foot in the door. Now I got to do a bunch of stuff to stay there, right? And now Joe Madden and Mike Socia and all these other coaches will vouch for my work ethic, my effort with, with players and making them better. And so I like to tell people, like when I went to consider a job and an opportunity with the New York Yankees, I knew George Steinbrenner, the owner of the Yankees. He didn't know me. So it doesn't matter who I know. If he knows me to be like, oh, hey, Trent Clark already been in three World Series at the age of 33, man, this guy's a guy we got to help us take to the promised land. Let's take a hard look at this guy. And he's telling his general manager, hey, this is a guy that I want to get us a serious look at. That's a different interview. That's a different process entirely. But yeah. that's not the way it was because they didn't know who I was. So, Luke, it's so important what you just said about your personal brand. And I can't say it enough about that value. So now we have Luke Hustler, who people are willing to follow. You've created some value for a bunch of people and you're going to start. Uh, it's Innovate, right? Is that the number? Is that your group? In, in, invigorate. Invigorate. I'm sorry. Yep. Invigorate yep. with the eight at the end, like invigorate. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and so talk to me about the two years. What happened? Yeah. So we um we found some pretty quick success, you know, like we, we pretty quickly scaled the company to where we had, I think it was at one time we had like 500 clients that we were working with at one time. And we, um we were focusing on like Instagram growth and growing people's pages and growing their brands primarily on Instagram. And so everything was going great. And then, you know, it's, I don't know, it's probably a week as crazy, right? It's a week before my wedding actually. And um, what happens is Instagram, 
Instagram does an update. And so we did this. So we had the software that we were working with to help grow accounts. Instagram did an update and made it so that the software like wasn't working anymore. So we're like, all right, cool. We, we anticipated this coming. Not a big deal. Like we can transition. We have something, another, a backup plan to go and do this. We go in within it because we have to, you know, there's a transition time period. So we can't charge accounts, you know, like while we're transitioning to the new growth strategy. And so we have to take a deeper look at the books. And so at the time we had a CFO, he was a friend of mine, and he would always give us the reports every single month. We would read whatever he gives us. And that was the whole game. But this is the first time now I'm like diving into all these books on my own. So I'm logging into the bank accounts. I'm seeing all these different types of things. And we thought we were going to have X amount of money in the bank account. And we had Y amount of money in the bank account. When out of nowhere, we, you know, lost a lot of money. I'm not going to dive into details of what it was, but it was enough to basically make the company go bankrupt at that point because we didn't have the funds that were there. And that was because we had a, a business partner who embezzled money strictly from the company. And here's the crazy thing is that how it worked is that he was in the financial game and he was a trader. And he basically, he was like, Hey guys, do you mind if we trade some of the company money? We had extra funds just sitting in a bank account. Right. And we're like, he's, here's my results. We're like, okay, let's go. You know, why not make the money multiply? And he took some money and then he traded it and then he lost that money. And he's like, oh, well, I can't tell him I lost it. Let's just take a little more and I'll earn it back, you know? And then he did that and lost that. And it was this, this process where eventually ended up now losing. It's gambling. <laughs> it's gambling, right? You lose tens of thousands of dollars, then you lose it, right? And so what started out as something that was good intentioned, you know, where it was y'all agreed to it, he just, you know, it, it learned into something really bad. So anyways, that company ended up shutting down. And that was like, I said, like a week before my wedding. So I'm like, dealing with all this stuff at one time is pretty, pretty intense. And I don't know what was harder is like the financial burdens or like the emotional burdens. Cause it was like a good friend that does that, you know, and you're just like, who can I even trust in this world? And that's, mm. a, that's a difficult thing to go through. <laughs> yeah. I think that is a challenge, right? We feel like we've been trespassed against and, you know, we lose our faith in humanity. Right. And, and it's like, man, that's not, and I think like you said, like, Hey, Listen, this is not the intention. I mean, you don't, this is a person making a, an effort to contribute to your bottom line, to create value for your organization that obviously executed really poorly. And I think sometimes that's the issue that we have to dive back to is the root cause of where it all started. And um, man, as many people as I've, as I've talked to have gone to challenges in their life, I find that, you know, most people aren't bad people. They're good people making bad decisions. And so it's frustrating and I, and I hate to see a loss of humanity, but it's an easy go-to, man. I mean, you know, the, the pain is real. And I think you just posed a good question. I don't know what was worse, financial loss or the emotional burden of carrying it because that's a huge challenge. It is. It actually, my wife helped me get a lot of that faith back into humanity. She helps remind me of that perspective that you just talked about because we all have our issues, you know, like everyone, no one's perfect at the end of the day. But I mean- I'm personally a Christian and like I do my best to try and like live by, you know, the the standpoint of just, you know, forgiveness, right? And you judge the sinner, not the, or you judge the sin, not the sinner type stuff because we all have our own issues. And so I do my best to try and live within that. But now in business, especially, I always, I trust, but verify, right? Like I'll trust everybody, but I'm also going to verify everything because yeah. um because at the end of the day, that was my fault, right? Like I trusted him that he was just the numbers he was giving us were true. Like I could have easily looked up, I could have gone to my app, looked at the bank account myself and like checked all that out but I didn't do that. So it's so easy for me to blame him. But at the end of the day, I got to take responsibility for my own situation and I got to learn from it. I can't, I can't trip on that branch again. Right? So, I yeah. mean, I think that's right. I think that's amen right there. Like, you know, I, I love the quote, you are responsible for your results. Yeah. So like, Hey man, if I don't, as the CEO, if I don't manage all the responsibilities that are under my care, like, and I, and, and man, I, I remember like when I first joined EO, it was like 2010 or 2011. I joined the entrepreneur organization. I was in Chicago and, and one of the guys came in, he's got a tech company and he's like, trust God, all else bring data. <laughs> like, hey man, like, I guess that's it, bro. Like, you know, like I don't trust any of you guys, man. Like, you know, you better show me and make me a believer. But he's like, yeah, I'll trust God. You know, that was it. So I thought like, man, I thought long and hard about that very philosophically because we do, we do want to put our trust in people, but it is our role to understand exactly what's going on and getting clarity around that. And that is a very challenging and difficult lesson. And you know, I've seen a lot of it, unfortunately, in my work, in my line of work, consulting with companies. I've seen so much mm. embezzlement. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And there's a lot of things that I think really are very preventable. I do think there's probably some level that it's going to happen. But I think the issue is, is like most of it could have been stopped very early. 
right? If we really had our checks and balances in place, we'd have been like, oh man, we made a mistake. And this error probably cost us like five grand. And it was, it was, it was an issue. And, and there's maybe a character and integrity issue we got to deal with for sure. Values of our company, how do, how do we run? And those are other issues we got to deal with for sure. But, but a lot better than half a million, you know, or 5 million, you know, where, where I've seen some or bigger numbers I've seen. Yeah. And and it's not uncommon that it's the close friend. It's the, my sister in the, in the AR department or the AP. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how Thanksgiving goes after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a tough Thanksgiving. That's for sure. <laughs> rough it's true so let's pivot a little bit man like now you're rolling you've got your, your you got your third firm going here your firm ace branding hitting on the cylinders you're taking your lessons you learned you're executing tell me a little bit about ace branding and what's working yeah absolutely so ace is actually an acronym for our core values it stands for accountability collaboration and excellence and the whole mission of the company is to serve those who serve others i learned in my first company as i kind of mentioned to you that like i can get really motivated to become successful and create a lot of like value in the marketplace but i just can't do it around just like the idea of just wanting to make money you know like because i i did that frankly like, when i was younger like when i hit that i got the mercedes I got the Rolex. I got the clubs. I got the nice clothes. I got all this stuff thinking it was going to make me happy. And it didn't at all, at all. And so what does make me happy is feeling like I'm leaving the world a better place than I found it, like genuinely impacting other people. And so that's why we made our mission to serve those who serve others. So we focus on finding impact-driven thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and businesses, and we want to amplify their voice through digital PR. And the primary verticals that we focus on are press, podcasts, and TV. The overall thesis is, is kind of what we talked about a little bit earlier here. It's just the fact that like, like when people look you up online, they're either going to look on search or on social. And um, oftentimes it's true that first impressions last a lifetime. But in today's digital age, it's usually not a handshake or a conversation, but a Google or social media search that's going to determine that first impression. And if you don't have a narrative out there that is going to, let's say, position you as an authority, as a credible figure, then you can let the, whatever comes up the internet, it, it, that, that's going to control the narrative. So I'll give you an example. You have two different people that you're thinking of work. The first person, you Google them, nothing comes up. Maybe an old Facebook that they had a while ago and you look through it and it's a bunch of pictures of their family, different things like that. The other person you Google and you look them up, here's an article in Forbes, in USA Today, and you know, International Business Times. You look at their profile. They have a relatively large social media. They're putting out quality content around the topic that you're going to be hiring them for, right? If all else is equal, which person are you going to be more likely to trust with your business? And it's going to be the person who has the quality content and the perceived credibility out there. So that's what we focus on is we want to help anticipate that when people look you up, they're going to look on those two verticals. And we want to give you the resources to position your brand as an authority to build trust and help separate you from the competition. So that's that's what we focus on. Yeah, I love it. I love how you defined you know, who you really want to work with. I think that really is a, is a challenge for a lot of organizations who are like, well, we want to work with everybody. <laughs> like everybody's our client. I'm like, oh my God, I don't like your marketing program already. <laughs> right. Like you know, how do you focus? Right. And it seems like in the day of, of man, the more niche, the better getting targeted on where you really want to be and where you want to spend your time. I, I think it also speaks into what you're talking about, your values, right? Like this is, this is where we create value and we've turned out back to what you said earlier in the show, which is, I, I think I can create value in this world and I think I can create revenue and, and value financially too and live the lifestyle I really want to live. Like, uh, so I think that's huge, man. And you've had some, you've, you know, let's, let's talk about this because you've had some interesting things going on that same values. Uh, you've worked with Jordan Belfort of Wolf of Wall Street, right? You, you've worked with Calvin Johnson, longtime Detroit Lion, you know, Megatron, as we all know him here. And most people do know him. Um, you've got some time in with Dr. Seuss and, and their brand and such an iconic brand. What have you learned along the way with iconic people on their digital? What's the tripwire that everybody's missing, Luke? The tripwire that everybody's missing. I would say it's the fact that people put everyone else on a pedestal, you know, it's like, but everyone's a human at the end of the day, like whether you're meeting, you know, a hall of fame receiver or the CEO of Dr. Seuss or, you know, Jordan Belfort, or whoever it is, like they are human beings at the end of the day, just like you and me, they've got two legs, you know, they, they, they breathe oxygen. They like, they are humans. And I think so many times in life, we look at these people and we put them on like larger to life pedestals because of their accomplishments. But like the real reason they are where they are falls into their habits and their routines. They're just willing to do what other people aren't 
you know, so they can live a life that most people can't. And so I think that is a, a huge thing that I've seen. And then the other thing that I found is like a lot of these people are actually really, really good people. So take like both Calvin and then we'll take the Jordan Belfort, like Calvin Johnson, when we met with him, one of the things that like jumped out the most about me with him is just his heart for helping people. Like he really cares about his community. He really wants to go and give back. He genuinely does. It's not just an act, not just something he's saying to like look good in the public and these different types of things. Like he has a heart for helping people, which is incredible. Then you look at someone like a Jordan Belfort and like he knows he messed up. Like he will be the first person to tell you, hey, here's what not to do. And now here's where I'm at now. This is what you should do, you know? And he embraces that, you know? And it's like, and so, and, and now he wants to help people miss, you know, not do what he did. And so I think that that is, and also an amazing thing because you don't have to like be stuck in your past. Again, I have a past. Everyone has a freaking past. And it's like, you don't want to look at people through the lens of their past. Look at them through their recent actions. What are they doing now? Because I think your your priorities reflect your true values at the end of the day. Like where you put your time and your attention, that shows what you prioritize. Well, I love, I love like you say, like, you know, like for Jordan in particular, like, you know, you don't have to always be that person, right? Like they yeah. made a movie about like his life about all the air is great. Very entertaining. But at the end of the day, like, hey, there's errors in my ways and and back to the responsibility of it all. And I think it's a big deal. And I think when you're getting people's heart, like uh, when they start moving and aligning with their values and which direction they're going to be going, such an impact and things move much quicker because when things are outside your value lane, you know, you immediately like, why would we go on that highway? That's that's the wrong interstate, man. Like, this is our value highway. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, well, we could do this. We could do that. And you're like, yeah, it's not. <laughs> no, that must be going east and west because we're going north, south. And that's an even number. So that's got to be going uh, east and west for me. And that's not where we want to be. That's so right. I think that it, it really targets and start starts really helping the focus of things. Let's let's talk about a few things that you found working mm-hmm. with these high level and, and yourself, too, in your own success. What are some of those things that you've seen, maybe two or three things that you've seen that they're willing to do that other people aren't willing to do? These are just human beings that are that are taking on things that other people aren't willing to do. What, what would be some examples of that? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll talk at it from like a PR perspective. So like we found like a process and a framework that works really well. They're kind of like everybody follows in a, one way or another. And so the first step of it is what we call our reputation to results roadmap. So it's like before we ever engage with somebody on any level is we want to make sure that we want to know where they're at, where they want to be. And we have a plan to get there. It's like when you get in a car, you don't just drive, you know, you have a destination and you have directions on how to get to your destination. It's got to be the same thing whenever you're doing any type of PR, public relations, branding, anything like that. You've got to have clarity within that. And I think a lot of people miss that. Number one, number two is then the next thing we focus on is like social proof. And so the idea behind social proof and perceived credibility is just that like, again, people judge you based on what they see online, like, because we're a digital PR firm. So we are focusing on your online reputation. That is what we want to go and focus on. And it's like, when people Google you, when they look you up, will they perceive you as credible or will they not? And what we tell people is there's like a framework where it's like, if they perceive you as credible, then they'll give you access to them. If you get, meaning they'll respond to a message or they're, their inquire. Then after that, if you can actually build a relationship with them, then you can then eventually go and get a result. And so like, that's kind of the framework. It's like perceived credibility opens the door to give you access. Once you have access, then you build a relationship. Once you have the relationship, then you can go and get them a result, pay for something, whatever the result is, you know, it depends on the client that we're working with. So anyways, building that social proof is really important for people. And usually it's got to come from third party credibility. So this is where us getting people featured in major media, getting them on various podcasts, getting on TV shows, that's a way for them to build up that social proof and perceived credibility. And this is also important for people who are starting a new narrative. Like Calvin Johnson, for example, like he's a hall of fame football player, but now he's an entrepreneur, right? So you have to shift that narrative to a new thing. And so it's the same process, you know, even for him at his level, it's actually harder because he has such a strong reputation in one area. And then the final piece is then after you go have, okay, here's my plan. Now I have social proof and perceived credibility around the area that I want to be the expert in or whatever narrative I'm looking to go tell. Then the idea is you then have to drive a targeted file. Following. And so the concept behind this is that it's like, whenever someone has a product, service, opportunity, message, whatever it is, if it is real, then it should have value in the world. And if it has value, that means it's solving someone's problems. And so if, and if it's solving someone's problems, that means there's someone who has that problem that is literally praying for your solution. Like it, maybe it's, if it's weight loss, they're, they're fat and they're trying to lose weight, right? Maybe they're trying to get into, they're trying to make more money and they don't know how to go and do it, right? There's a bajillion examples of this, but the idea is that 
there's someone out there looking for you. And so when we focus on these campaigns, we're not trying to convince the people who think otherwise to change their mind. We're basically looking for those who are looking for you. So it's a sorting process, not a convincing process. And so it's like there is somewhere on the Internet that already has the attention of these people. Maybe it's influencers they're following, podcasts that they're watching, blogs that they're reading, social media accounts, whatever it is. And if we can just simply present your messaging in front of them there, then naturally that's going to give everything that you want as long as they perceive you as credible, as someone who can actually help them. And we have an effective plan to then take that attention and turn it into a result. And so like those are kind of the three frames that we look at everything. And if someone's you know campaign isn't working, it's usually either a strategy is wrong somewhere. They don't have credibility in that area that we're trying to market to, or we don't have enough targeted traffic. We're marketing to the wrong demographic of people and we kind of like readjust it from there. Wonderful. I mean, man, that's so targeted. And man, I really, I really identify with the fact like, I don't want to convince people you need to work with me. Like, I'm, yeah. I know you should work with me. Like, I don't, I don't need to convince you. You know, it's just a matter of like, hey, is it a fit for you? Can we both win by working together is, is always my narrative. Like, yeah, I've got lots of tools that can help you. But I also, I, I'm, I'm pretty tough on clients. Like, I don't want people to come to me because of, pro sports or this, that, like I need people to be motivated to actually do the work for us to be successful. And we're, you know, we're a gym, we're not a spa. Like uh, you're not coming here to get, you know, the, the services you're coming here to get guidance and do the work. And when you do the work, like you said, and you'll do the things that most people won't amazing what kind of results you'll get. Right. And so, uh, especially when guided by people that have been there and done it. So man, that's powerful stuff. So if kind of wrap things up, Luke, you know, a lot of people are challenged right now, man. It's it's a crazy year. It's an election year, man. It seems like the economy is kind of in a jacked up spot. Some businesses are booming. Some businesses are just in a mess, which is not uncommon in any kind of environment, but there's some inconsistencies and people are definitely struggling. And I think more emotionally and mentally than ever, but if you were talking to someone who's who's been there, been where you're at, I mean, you face some pretty tough challenges of two significant closings of, of major brands that you'd already created. You know, and they're in that kind of spot. What would you tell them? What, what's been effective for you to get back up and get going, get moving in the right direction? What would you tell them? I always tell myself, I cannot lose if I do not quit. <laughs> that is what I always have told myself. And um, I think everyone needs to remember that is that if you don't quit, you can't lose as well. As long as you can learn again, as long as you don't trip on the same branch twice, as long as you actually can learn from the mistakes that you made and you don't continue to make the same mistakes, it is impossible to lose as long as you freaking don't quit. Because there was a quote that um, I think was out, not Albert Einstein. It was, um, Thomas Edison, when he was creating the incandescent light bulb, he was being interviewed, right, by by a reporter. And they were like, you know, you failed tens of thousands of times while creating this light bulb. Like, why didn't you quit? And he said, you see, that's the difference between you and me. I never failed. I successfully figured out what didn't work. And by successfully figuring out what didn't work, I eventually figured out what worked. And so what the reporter and the general public perceive as a failure because the light bulb exploded when he tried to do it, he looked at it as a success because he knew it was a process of elimination. And what's crazy about business is that you only have to be right once for you to be an overnight success story. Everybody always talks about the one big hit that they got. This person's done this and that and this and that, but they don't talk about the graveyard of other businesses that are out there. I mean, even in my story, it's like we talked about two experiences that I've went through. I could sit here for another hour and a half talking about other little businesses that I did on the side and things like that, that also didn't go out there and work out. But All people want to talk about is the success and this and that. And it's like, and and so it's the reality is just failure is going to happen. Number one, accept it, deal with it, learn from it and don't freaking quit and keep going. And if you can do that, you truly can win. And this is, this is the last thing I'll say on this is that it's like, I feel like we live in such a microwave society, like this generation, my generation, me, I deal with this is like, we, our expectations are so messed up. Like we see these people on Instagram and these things like this, like making the Lambo in a year and like, whatever. It's like, that's not real. You know, it's not real. It's like, that was, that was me when I first started, right? I'm 21. I'm like, Oh, dude, my first business crushed it. This is so easy. Look at my watch, look at my car. This is great. You know, that person just hasn't been in the game long enough to realize the realities of the game. Cause guess what? It's a season, right? Like I'm in Michigan. Winter comes no matter what. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
it doesn't matter. It's going to come. And, and so, we and we act like we're surprised every time, right? Like, you say, oh, my gosh, man. Like, it's, like, cold today. And, like, it's December 1st, bro. Like, it's going to be cold, man. When did you think this thing was – you knew it was going to arrive sometime, right? That's it. That's it. And that's what I just tell people in business. And it's like, but if you can understand it and stay in the game, like, you can win because most people are so soft. You know, they get this one hit and they're like, oh, my gosh, my life is so hard. You will never imagine what happened to me. Listen to this story. And they just, like, have this narrative in their head. And it's like this woe is me stuff. And it's like, man, like, just don't do that. Okay. (laughs) Like take responsibility for your life. Don't quit and just give it your all. And like, it is crazy how simple it is to really win. And it will take longer than you think. Probably you'll second guess yourself a bajillion times. You're going to have your family members doubt you, your friends doubt you. But if you can stay consistent and not quit and keep learning, you will eventually win. It's not a question of if it's a matter of when. Love it. Man, we're wrapping with that, man. Lou Kessler on the show. Winners find a way. Love it. Great stuff. Always join us every Friday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Winners find a way on LinkedIn Live, YouTube on the Leadership channel, and Facebook Live. You can find our podcast on all the major networks. To everybody out there, please join us. And for Lou Kessler, thank you so much for joining us, buddy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. For everybody else, winners find a way. Organizations come to me all the time with challenges of execution and communication with their teams. We help build a system through Bloom Growth and software that gives them simplification and prioritization. I teach, facilitate, and coach these organizations to literally double their value. If you're interested in gaining your individual and organizational growth, please email me at trent at leadershipity.com or click the link below and book a 15 minute call on my Calendly.